Hello, my name is Kevin Prince. I'm told I have a face for radio and a voice for the telegraph, so I apologize for any lack of uh, professionalism or quality around this, this video. What I do have, though, is a love of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for years, there's been a lot of talk about the Revelation 12 sign that appeared in the sky on September 2017. As I researched this topic in depth, I discovered something that is so profound that I realized that we all missed the true meaning behind that sign. And until now, we only partially understood its significance. I put this presentation together to explain that in, in depth. Uh, first, there are some individuals that still look to the stars for signs from God, although this number seems to get smaller and smaller all the time. But some believe that looking into the night sky for signs from God is archaic at best. And yet God has always presented signs in the heavens to mark specific events the most celebrated of which is the star that led the three wise men to the Savior. We don't give that, a, that story a second thought around Christmas time, but yet most of us don't think of signs in, in that way. And even though we are specifically told in the scriptures that we should be looking for signs, uh, most of us don't. Yet in 2011, William Tapley published a video about an alignment in the stars that he believed was the literal fulfillment of what is described in the first two verses of Revelation 12. Since that time, thousands of people have agreed and expounded upon what they believe this sign means. At the same time, this may be your first time hearing about this, so let me make sure we're all on the same page. John the Revelator in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation he records the following, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child, cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. This is where most people stop attempting to discern the meaning, although there are many uh, interesting verses after this, which we are going to, to talk about. These verses have literally captured the imagination of artists, philosophers, scholars, and countless others throughout time. These are just a few artist renderings of those two verses. They're all statues, or there are statues all over the world from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, all illustrating these verses. So why is everyone so focused on these verses? They describe events of the last days, knowing when this event will occur can lead one to a better idea of other signs of the times and getting prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ. William Tapley discovery went uh, viral and since then there have been countless books, videos, blog posts, and infographics posted online with various interpretations and explanations. Some people thought when September 23rd, 2017 arrived, it would be the beginning of the millennium. Some thought it was the beginning of the end of times or the end of the half hour of silence also spoken of in the book of Revelation and many other interpretations. Well, I made a discovery that I believe tells us exactly what is meant by the sign that I want to explain to you. But first, let's make sure we all understand what the sign was because the details in this really, really matter. Revelation 12 describes a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. Charles and now many, many others believe this to be the constellation Virgo, where in much of the month of September, it appears that the sun is part of her clothing. Also on a specific day each month in September, the moon is at her feet. Verse 1 in Revelation 12 also describes that upon her head, she has a crown of 12 stars. As you can see, the constellation of Leo, the lion, is above her head. Leo has nine stars in it. So how is it that she can have 12 stars like Revelation describes? Well, once every year and a half or so, you can find three of the planets from our solar system near the top of Virgo's head or around Leo. When this occurs, the woman has a crown of 12 stars. That is in of itself is quite rare because while having three planets uh, in that specific area of the sky at the same time happens every year and a half or so, as I said, and having that correspond at the same time with the sun being in Virgo in September and the moon being under her feet 
it, that it kind of constitutes a pretty rare occurrence. The real kicker, though, is what happens with Jupiter and what is described in verse 2. It says, she being uh, with child, cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. So the woman is pregnant. It just so happens that Jupiter, every 83 years, go into, goes into what's called retrograde of Jupiter, which makes it look like the planet oscillates inside uh, Virgo's belly for just over nine months, the same amount of time it takes a baby to gestate. The retrograde of Jupiter happens due to how Jupiter looks being a, a moving planet in orbit uh, from another moving planet, which is us on, on Earth. When you combine this phenomenon with Jupiter combined with the sun, moon, and three planets, this is very, very rare and closely matches the description from Revelation 12. But there's more that is often ignored because it is not understood. Verse 3 reads, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. This really throws off people because there isn't a dragon near Virgo. The constellation Draco, which is a dragon, is a ways away, and the planet orbits don't go anywhere near there. As I looked at the Bible concordance, at the translation of the word dragon, I realized that there's more often than not, it can also mean something else. It can mean serpent. And there is a serpent just below Virgo, right where um, Jupiter exits, representing the baby in this case. So you can see that, that serpent uh, right there. In fact, all throughout the Bible, dragon, serpent, and even Leviathan are all interchangeable. Look at this single verse in Isaiah, where all three uh, terms are used describing the exact same thing. And again, you can see how the interpretation from he Hebrew can be a serpent. And is that all that surprising anyway? As we see in a few verses, this is describing Satan. And how did Satan appear to Eve in the Garden of Eden? As a snake, a serpent. The serpent just below the constellation of Virgo is called Serpens. Serpens is a two-part constellation. In fact, it is the only constellation that is broken up into two parts. Serpens caput, which is Latin for head of the serpent, which is here. And there is Serpens calda. Latin for tail of the serpent, which is here. It is divided by Ophetius, the, the Ophetius constellation, which his left hand holds the serpent. While serpents has always been considered to have two parts throughout time, and even now, some people um, associate some stars with the Ophetius constellation and others with serpents. In Revelation 12, John describes the serpent as having seven heads and ten horns. It is interesting that this one constellation that is broken up into two parts has seven stars on its head. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, while the tail has ten stars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Some might say, hey Kevin, there aren't seven heads, but I can see that there are seven stars. But snakes don't have horns, so, so how do you associate that with a tail and ten horns? Well, the translation of the word head can have several meanings, including lord or ruler. The word horn can have alternate meanings, including and being a symbol of power. Biblical numerology would also suggest there is a deeper meaning with the number seven and ten as well. Seven meaning complete or perfect, and ten is a bit of a trickier one because it depends on the context. If it's in the context of something good, then it can mean God's laws or the Ten Commandments, something like that. When it's in the context of something wicked, it can mean something very evil and powerful, such as the Ten Plagues of Egypt. Combining this imagery could suggest that when this event happens, that the serpent, meaning Satan, is at his most complete or is at his strongest. But also said it was a red dragon or serpent, 
you can see from these pictures that some of the brightest stars appear red or orange, including the Alpha Serpens, which is the red giant star, as well as the famous Red Square Nebula, this picture being from NASA. You can see the famous pillars of creation in this three-color composite mosaic image of the Eagle Nebula, which is inside the Serpens constellation. An even closer shot of the pillars of creation are on your right, complements of the Hubble telescope. But what about the seven crowns upon his head that was in verse three? Well, look at what is just above the serpent's head. Corona Borealis is another constellation that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stars upon his head. In other words, a crown with seven stars. Think about how God would try to give us a sign that maps to a very specific day. How specific would he need to be? How it would have to transcend language and time and geography and even human nature? I find this explanation of the first few verses of Revelation 12 very compelling. The problem is the way we have interpreted it isn't entirely correct. But keep in mind that there are only nine planets in the solar system. No, we aren't going to get into a debate about Pluto, even, even if we could or decided to count it, we can't see it anyway, so it doesn't really matter. We are on Earth, so Earth doesn't count, and Jupiter is the planet that is exiting Virgo, and Neptune is too dim to see with the naked eye, which leaves five planets, of which three of them have to be in nearly the same position at the same time. This is quite rare. So on any given day, there's only about a 1 in 250 chance of that happening. Then combine this with Virgo being clothed in the sun, meaning that it is around September, which is a 1 in 12 chance. Then the moon has to be just under Virgo's feet, which happens one night each month. Then add on how often Jupiter is exiting Virgo after oscillating there for nine months. That happens one month every 83 years. So combine that all together, and it makes these verses in Revelation 12 a very, very rare occurrence. In fact, if you think about how many days there have been since John the Revelator gave this revelation, it is 711,750 days, approximately, give or take. At the same time, we're talking about one uh, to 84 million chance, an 84 million 672 thousand chance on any given day that all of those conditions uh, are met. Some say it is more common than that. Um, if you if you read, uh, some say that you know four times in the last thousand years that it's happened, but they aren't looking closely enough. Um, there are many instances where it's close. Um, but it's not exactly right. You know, 2 BC, 1483, 1293, 1056, uh, even 1832. But some are ignoring the moon's position and some of the planets are too low or too high. Um, you know, some of it, it doesn't include what Jupiter has to be exiting after nine months uh, within Virgo. When you carefully take these specific requirements, it has only happened twice since John the Revelator wrote the book of Revelation nearly 2,000 years ago. And don't take my word for it. Download the Stellarian software just like I did for free. I've put the link there right there on the, on the page. Plug in the dates and look for yourselves. But yes, you heard me right. It has happened twice. Well, we all know about the occurrence in, in 2017, which brought our attention to this in the first place. But there was another occurrence. Interestingly, both occurrences happened on the same calendar day. September 23rd, that's when the sign actually occurred. The day before, September 22nd, is the first day of the new Jewish year, which is the last day of Rosh Hashan. September 21st, the day before that, ends the very significant day uh, of the Jewish calendar after 5,777. A lot of symbolism around that date, and most uh, Jews believe that was a very special year uh, with the 777 uh, being such a holy number. That's also the last day of Elul. And September 20th, Rosh Hashan begins that evening. This other occurrence also happened on September 23rd. The day before was also 
the new year, uh, the last day of Rosh Hashanah. Same thing with uh, uh, September 21st, the end of the, the Jewish calendar. And September 20th, Rosh Hashanah began in the evening. I'll explain in a minute why this special Jewish holiday is, is important to our understanding of Revelation 12, but it is very unusual uh, that not only does this astrological event fall on the same calendar day of the month of these two different years, but, they, but that they are also the same Jewish holiday dates as Rosh Hashanah. Uh, it can land, Rosh Hashanah can land anywhere from late August to early October, so like a 40-day swing. The other year this took place was 1827. So be aware that the three planets are in the exact same spot as 2017. In 2017, they are more in uh, around Leo, and in 20 in 1827, uh, uh, two of the three are around Virgo's head. Uh, but I believe that everyone has been so focused on the sign happening in 2017 that no one stopped and thought about this happening in 1827. So what happened in 1827? If if that's the date that um, John the Revelator was really talking about, what happened? September 22nd, 1827 is the day after, after four years of waiting, the angel Moroni allowed Joseph to get the gold plates from the Hill Cumorah. The very next day he uh, is given the plates, the sign is manifest in the heavens. Is that coincidence? Now when you read through the rest of Revelation 12, let's skip to verse 5 for a moment. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. A rod of iron is an interesting choice of words. The exact same words are used in Lehi's dream and in 1 Nephi 11.25 in the Book of Mormon to describe the word of God. Verse 5 is talking about the gold plates coming forth. In other words, the sign in Revelation 12 is to mark the time when the plates become available to the world. This is a big deal. This is huge. The sign is about the gospel being restored. We will talk about the significance of, uh, of the two occurrences in a few minutes. But the first and more important uh, to, to the world is Joseph Smith getting the gold plates. Bring forth the Book of Mormon. This is an event that John the Revelator wanted us to know about. This is what was architected in the heavens. I'll, I'll go through additional verses in a moment, but first, there is more significance to this date than just the alignment of the stars, the sun, and the moon, on, and the planets on that, uh, on that day. The prophet Joseph Smith received the plates on the annual day when the Jews throughout the world celebrated the symbolic meaning of Israel's final gathering. There is a great article put out by the church that you can see on the link on the bottom of the screen. That describes in great deal the significance of these Jewish holidays and the relationship to the day Joseph got the plates from Moroni. But let's go through some of the highlights because it further illustrates the importance of this day. Regarding the first day of the Jewish New Year, the last day of Rosh Hashanah, this feast was ripe with meaning for the theme of the regathering of Israel. It is unlikely this timing was accidental. Indeed, young Joseph was asked to meet Moroni for four years in preparation of that significant day in 1827. It signifies the beginning of Israel's final harvest, the day God has set to remember his ancient promises, to regather Israel, a time for a new revelation that would lead to a new covenant with Israel, and a time to prepare for the millennium. The article talks about the beginning of Israel's final harvest. It says, it is noteworthy that the word of the Lord to Latter-day Saints is full of harvest imagery. For behold, the field is wide already to harvest, and lo, he that thrusteth in his sickle with his might, the same layeth up in store, that he perisheth not. As modern prophets have said, the Book of Mormon is the major instrument in the, the Lord has prepared to initiate his final harvest. Therefore, it is significant that the golden plates were received on the 22nd of September, 1827, coinciding with the beginning of Israel's fall, garnering with symbolism and the onset of its final harvest of souls. What no one has contemplated before now 
is that Revelation 12 was also describing this event in detail. How amazing is that? The Hebrew name used uh, today for the Feast of Trumpets is Rosh Hashan, which is the Jewish New Year. But this was not its original name. So though the day does to, to signify a new beginning, one of its original names was the Day of Remembrance. This name arose because the Lord commanded Israel to blow trumpets on this day for remembrance. According to tradition, it was on this day that the Israelites were remembered and freed from slavery in Egypt prior to the completed exodus. Various Jewish writers explain the purpose of the trumpet sound on the Feast of Trumpets, have taught that this day would eventually signal Israel's return from worldwide scattering. On September 22nd, 1827, Israel's trumpet sounded throughout the world. It was the day the prophet Joseph Smith received the golden plates, which would help fulfill God's promise to remember Israel in the last days. The blowing of the trumpet is the major ritual of the Feast of Trumpets because the first mention of the trumpet is at Mount Sinai. These instruments are seen by Jewish writers as a symbol of the revelation. The trumpet sounded is therefore understood by them as a memorial to the revelation and covenant given on Mount Sinai. Yet Rosh Hashan's trumpets blasts have been accepted by many Jews as uh, not just as a memorial of the ancient covenant revealed at Sinai, but as a prelude to a new and future covenant to be revealed, one that would result in Israel's ultimate redemption. So significant are these three days, the Feast of the Trumpets, which is Rosh Hashan, the Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is Sukkot, that together they are called by Jews the High Holy Days and the Days of Awe. Established prayers on this day urge repentance for the coming reign of the Messiah, and some teach that God will establish judgment of, quote, who shall live and who shall die, who shall be cast down and who shall be elevated, end quote. This judgment is based, of course, upon who is truly repentant and who continues to be worthy. The space between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement can signify the time one has left to repent. Thus, the trumpet of the Feast of Trumpets sounds a final warning. Time is crucial for returning to God and his righteousness. Now let's reread those verses in Revelations 12 again. But this time, let's use the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. Joseph made many significant changes to this chapter, and it isn't surprising that anyone attempting to understand these verses without the Joseph Smith translation would really struggle. What I've done here is use the strike through function for anything that Joseph uh, removed. You can see what was removed and the words in red uh, text have been added by the prophet. Additionally, some verses have been reordered by the prophet, which also makes a huge difference. This is very unique. Joseph didn't uh, reorder verses very often. If you don't have a full copy of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, I highly suggest you get one. You can buy it on Amazon. It is published by the Community of Christ Church, but has been validated by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to be authentic. Look at the first verse of what Joseph changed and there appeared to be a great sign in heaven, in the likeness of the things on the earth. He's talking about constellations, a sign in the heavens in the likeness of things on the earth, a likeness like a woman, like a serpent, like a lion or a crown. It is clear that he's talking about celestial signs. Notice verse five has been moved to verse three, which makes a big difference. But then look at verse 7, because he tells us exactly who the woman and the child are. And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman, which was the church of God, who has been delivered of her pains and brought forth the kingdom of our God and his Christ. So the woman is the church of God, and the child is the kingdom of God. Now this distinction, there is uh, for another video, the, the distinction between those two. Uh, but we are not talking about Christ in his second coming. We are talking about the restoration of the church, the priesthood, and temple covenants. You can see how the regular translation of the Bible, how people would become so confused about who the woman is and the child, etc. Now with the Joseph Smith translation, you can see that Satan is at the height of his power, waiting for the church to be restored so he can destroy it. 
those familiar with, with church history know just how real and destructive those attempts really were. Notice verse 4 in particular. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast uh, to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was delivered, ready to devour her child after it was born. For those of you not familiar with this, on November 13, 1833, the greatest meteor shower in the history of the world took place. It was on the night that a mob was coming to wipe out the Mormons in Kirtland, Ohio. Just before the mob attacked, the meteor shower began and lasted all night. You can read Joseph Smith's own account of what happened here. There are many other accounts that you can read online if you, if you want. It is a well-documented event. Joseph said that it was the literal fulfillment of the word of God as recorded in the Holy Scriptures. It's also interesting to note that the mob was so fearful, thinking that this was a sign from God, which of course was, that they did not do the attack. But also verse 4 references the third part of the stars of heaven were drawn by the serpent's tail. I find it interesting that the early church did have a significant apostasy that is estimated to be about a third of the church at that time. As you can see in the quote here, 10 to 15 percent of the members just in Kirtland apostatized in just a nine-month period. Certainly these verses include some imagery, but you know also have a type and a shadow of things passed with a with a reference of the war in heaven with Satan took, taking a, a third of the hosts of heaven. This is a good example of multiple fulfillments of, of revelations, multiple fulfillments of prophecy, which is what happened here with a sign that happened both in 1827 as well in 2017. Paul in writing the Corinthians said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I believe this applies to his signs and wonders as well. Look at other examples. Abraham, Moses were both hunted down as children, just like Christ was by Herod. Isaac was nearly sacrificed by Abraham, which is a similitude of God the Father being willing to sacrifice his son, Jesus Christ. The scriptures are literally full of them. In fact, it is more rare that something significant doesn't have multiple fulfillments, such as the flood with Noah. And the Lord makes sure everyone knows that this is one event that uh, even puts a sign in the heavens, the rainbow, as a promise not to do it again. Multiple fulfillments, in other words, a repeat of a, a similar sign or an event that is very, has very real significance because they foretell a future event that we have previously seen. That's what is made manifest through these multiple fulfillments. They're a similitude of things, the types and things to come. Some people with this interpretation of Revelation 12 might look at verse 5 uh, from the Joseph Smith translation and get kind of excited due to one major change. He changed the word days to years. This is something that many people recently have relied upon when they are trying to figure out the signs of the times and attempt to calculate when the second coming might be. This is both within our church and outside of the church. They really hang their hat on these number here. It's 1,203 score days is what uh, it's, is in the Bible. But meet take means in something entirely different if you think of 1,260 years. Unfortunately, very few use the Joseph Smith translation, so they are working off of erroneous data. And those that don't know when to you know, mark the beginning with an understanding that this Revelation 12 sign might have a better idea. So now let's let's remember that the the Lord says, but that day, no man knows the day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son of man, but the father alone. That being said, the Lord asks us to watch for signs of the times and watch and pray. Verse five appears to give a hint. It gives a sense of the timing uh, that would include the time from when the church flees into the wilderness um, through the, the end of the millennium. Now, although it would lack a degree of accuracy, I'm sure many of you are already doing the backwards math in your head to figure out what that really means if you were to add 1,260 years from this time. You know, listen, I don't have any idea when the second coming is going to, to happen. But what I do believe is that a repeat of the revelation uh, in this Revelation 12 sign in 2017 is a second fulfillment of this prophecy. So in 1827, I believe the sign described in Revelation 12 has several meanings, including, you know, the first 
Uh, the Lord uh, begins uh, Israel's final harvest. He restores the priesthood and temple covenants, and he had also you know, promised to do that. He warned them to repent and prepare. He warned them that the church and its members would also be persecuted. And he warned them about an apostasy of, the, uh, of a large portion of the church. So what about 2017 and the sign there? I believe that the church is going to go to uh, going to the next stage of its progression, especially when you consider all of the changes that President Nielsen has made since he's become prophet, which was just a few months after the sign was given. He became prophet uh, in early January 2018, again, just a, uh, three plus months um, after the sign was given. I think it is a warning to all of us that we need to be spiritually prepared and to repent. Greater persecution of the church and its members is coming. And if we aren't faithful, we could there could be a significant apostasy over the next several years of the church and its and its members. The Lord architected this sign in the heavens to warn us and prepare us for this difficult time ahead. But with his promise of salvation and exaltation, uh, we, we get that if we are true and faithful. This sign and prophecy given right as the Book of Mormon was coming forth, as well as just a few years ago, means there is no time to waste in shoring up our lives, spiritually, physically, financially, even emotionally, for the times we are going, going to go through now, as well as what lies ahead of us. I believe there is still a long road before Christ comes in glory, but we are in the midst of the signs of the times and of the last days, which are upon us. These signs are just further evidence of God's power and his love for his children. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If so, let me know in the comments. Subscribe if you like uh, to the video, and I'll work on future videos. Uh, there are a lot of topics that we can cover in this. Thank you guys very much.